Greetings, Church at Sun Valley and friends. We're here for part four of our series on spiritual depression and its causes and cures. And uh, today, I just wanted to, to deal with actually chapter two and three of the book that we're using. Coincidentally, spiritual depression, its causes and cures. Um, and uh, wanted to talk about, as you've heard me say many times, if you've listened to any of my sermons, that right understanding or right beliefs or right doctrine leads to right living. And so oftentimes our biggest issue with not experiencing the promises found in the Bible is because we truly don't understand them. And so today I'm going to deal with uh, chapter two and chapter three because they're kind of um, in some ways two sides of the same coin of misunderstanding uh, the promises in God's word. Now to start off, I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of an example uh, from maybe a, a a movie that you've seen, and that is Saving Private Ryan. Now, if you've ever seen P Saving Private Ryan, it is a story about uh, Private Ryan who has lost all of his brothers, have all died, and he doesn't know this. Um, but the the army finds this out, and now they want to send a group of people to come find him so that he can uh, make it through the war so that at least his family will have one uh, son who made it through. And they send Tom Hanks as the leader of this group, and there's a it's a small group of, of men who are just sent out to solely find him and bring him back. And as they go throughout the story, uh, different ones of them lose their lives in this action. And as they finally get to him at the end, there's a battle that's happening, and, and so he won't leave his uh, friends that he's fighting for, and so they end up having to fight this battle with him. And as they do, most of them all lose their lives. And the at the final one of the final scenes, uh, the captain Tom Hanks has been shot and is obviously going to die. And he grabs uh, Private Ryan and he pulls him close. And and in the midst of all the battle, he says, "Earn it," with the sense of, you know, you've you've had people uh, give their lives up for you. Earn it. And I think that's a common perception uh, from our world. In fact, in the final scene, you see him uh, as he's an old man and he's come back and he's in front of the grave of the captain and he and his wife sees him weeping and she comes up to him and he says, am I a good man? And although there's some good uh, ideas in the movie, oftentimes we think this is the same thing that when Christ died for us, he's called us to do. Um, he, we think that, that in the sense that Christ, as he's dying on the cross, would look at us and say, earn it. And at the end, we would have to ask ourselves, are we good people? But Romans chapter 3, verses 28, Paul writes to the exact opposite of this belief. He says this, for we maintain, meaning uh, the, those who are following Christ, we maintain that a person is justified or made righteous by faith apart from the works of the law. Meaning that, that you do not earn your righteousness, that there's nothing you do to gain righteousness. But not only that, he writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The words, you have been saved, is really having been saved. It's not just a, uh, a finished verb. It, it's not uh, done. It's actually having been saved. So there's a start, having been saved, but you're continually growing and becoming uh, more of who God's called. And within that whole process, for it is by grace, having been saved through faith, meaning not even in the future, not even after we receive, quote, salvation or or the ability to be justified from a sense of uh, now what Christ did makes us righteous enough and makes us actually holy in God's eyes. And therefore we receive the promised gift of heaven. But it is also this grace that we receive through faith that allows us to continue in that road of salvation. It is not by your works. Jesus never once would look at us and say, earn it. 
In fact, it would be the exact opposite. Paul says, if you think that you're going to stand before God and boast of your good deeds and how you have proven God right for having saved you, you are completely wrong. Now, the way this affects us in in talking about spiritual depression is oftentimes many people are fooled by the lie of the enemy and the lie of this world or just misunderstand the promise of grace of God and that we receive salvation as Christians, but then we go about and rather than understanding that we are free and no longer slaves of sin, we make ourselves slaves of the law. We begin to think that now I'm going to live this out in a good way and I'm going to make it work and I'm going to prove to God that I was worthy. The problem is we still constantly fail. And within that, we are, are if we believe this lie, our, our mindset is we cannot succeed. And it will often lead to depression. That we can't make it happen. That, oh, I've tried so hard to prove to God that I, that I am worthy. That instead it becomes a sense of I can never do enough. I never do it right enough. I never have enough of the good things. I keep falling. And so then we become upset and depressed because we don't realize that no matter what we do, the only thing that matters to God is faith. Is that us trusting that what he said was true. And what he said was, for by grace, having been saved through faith, that you will not be able to boast, that it will not be anything you do. It is solely by faith. In fact, Jesus actually talks about this in John 15, 5. He says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Did you catch that? That literally Jesus is saying that your sole job is to remain in me. Meaning by faith to to trust in him at all times. To trust that when he says he has done it all and our our one thing that, that we're called to do is put our faith in him. To trust him. That even after the saved moment that as he changes us what he's called us to do is not necessarily good works to earn the salvation, but to remain in him and be a part of the vine and allow his spirit to change us. That we have faith that, that yes, he's called us to live in a way set apart, sanctified, but it is he who does that in us. We cannot do that ourselves. We will not set ourselves apart. And, and, and the, so he says, remain in him and we will bear the fruit that we want to see. And that fruit will include the spiritual fruit of joy and peace rather than anxiety and fear, rather than depression and, 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 and feeling down all the time. Instead, the promises of the fruit is when we remain in him. And then he declares this, apart from him, you can do nothing. No amount of works, no amount of good things will create the fruit of peace and joy. None. And so uh, when we take it upon ourselves and begin to believe what the world feeds us and the enemy loves us to believe, which is, hey, okay, God saved you, but now you need to pay him back. You need to live the life and prove to him that you were worthy. And in that, in that false belief, we will live in a way in which we will self-condemn ourselves. Many of us will feel down, will feel depressed, will feel like we can't do it. There's no way to be successful. And the reality is Jesus would say, exactly. It is by us trusting in him. You know, the one thing that, that Paul says is make yourselves a living sacrifice. Basically put yourself on the altar Every day, giving yourself totally to him. Remember what Jesus said. What is the first and only, uh, the first commandment, the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That we give him our whole selves. That is the trust factor. And within that, he provides us the spiritual fruit of joy and peace and kindness and gentleness, self-control. All these things that we're going to do on our own so often the world declares we should is the fact that God says no. 
it has been done and that it will be done in you, not by your striving for it. Otherwise, you end up making yourselves, maybe you think I've been saved and no longer a slave to sin, but you just become a slave to the law, which is in essence, not necessarily any better. And your conscience and your mind are so easily come to a place where you fall into spiritual depression. Now, the third chapter says something a little different. And so he starts off, the writer of the book actually starts off using this scripture. It's it's Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. The disciples were following Jesus and it says, They came to Bethsaida and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand, led him outside the village. When he had spit on on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Now, obviously, we see Jesus actually heal many blind people, and it never took two steps for any other blind men. Jesus immediately healed them. And so it might be a question of, well, did Jesus just, you know, kind of uh, miss it this time, or or maybe uh, he wasn't fully empowered, or why was this different? And I I think the, the key here is Jesus is trying to teach us something in the midst of his healing. And so when he heals the man to begin with, he, he, he heals him enough that he, and he asks the question, can you see? And the man says, well, kind of, but not completely. I think that's another place. And the writer talks about this. Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about this, that oftentimes uh, we come to the point uh, whether we actually do accept Christ as our Savior, or maybe we've gone to church our whole lives and we kind of believe in some ways, we've grown up with the church and with an idea of Christianity, but maybe we've never made a profession of faith. Or as I said, maybe you went to VBS or you saw an evangelist or something happened and you made that initial decision and experienced the initial joy, but then you never continued on. We believe the same lie from a different side of the coin in that um, we begin to believe that, yes, maybe Jesus can save but the, what the world says is the way to joy just makes more sense. I mean, giving my whole life to, 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 to God and living uh, underneath him and remaining in him, that just my everything the world has, has taught me, everything that uh, this natural flesh desires is somehow I'm going to find pleasure in the things that I do. Satisfaction in completing work. Um, looking for my joy and my peace in things that, uh, more things, or in ways that the world says, this is how you do it. And so we never really see, we might have experienced an initial salvation, but we've never continued on in giving ourselves wholly to God in faith. We, we've been saved, but are not experiencing salvation. We're not experiencing sanctification, becoming set apart through Christ, we hold ourselves back and continue to live as though the world has the answers. And some, you go to church and, and you do all the right things, and yet you you just really haven't completely trusted God. And you're not experiencing the joy and the peace because of that. And so you've never asked God, not just for an initial healing, but to be healed, to really experience those things outside uh, of what the world promises to to gain the joy because it, yeah it in some ways you just you mean I'm gonna get joy and peace by surrendering my life I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna gain satisfaction not by proving my identity to those around me and and making myself important I'm gonna I'm gonna become a servant that that just doesn't make any sense and yet if we don't follow him all out and believe and trust him in what he says in God in his word then we never truly get to experience the completeness of the healing and so today one i want to encourage you to uh to read the chapters themselves cuz they give a fuller explanation of this but i want you to think about have you 
given in to the lie that you are going to make it happen. That that you're going, you're, maybe you're uh, depressed or, or you're fearful or you're anxious and or you're worried about how people see you or all these different things and you think, man, I've got to I've got to fix that by doing things or or you see what God did and you said, man, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you think that I'm worthy. I'm going to I'm going to do everything in my power to to earn this. You know, to close this, I give you one last example. When I was in high school, my senior year, I was in English class and uh, the teacher handed out all these tests and it was a little longer than our normal test. And yet we still only had an hour and she left us with these instructions she said, I want you to read all the directions and the entire test before starting. Now, I knew, and most of us knew, we only had so much time, and that's not normally how we would take tests. In fact, we had learned that, you know, an English test, when you're reading something for comprehension, uh, it was easier to go ahead and read the questions first and then go back and read the passage. And so, uh, as the test started, everyone opens it up and starts doing stuff and, and working. I'm finding myself and I'm going through. And uh, and about five or six minutes in, I see a couple of people turn their papers in. Now, to be honest, those were people that I not ne- I didn't necessarily think were uh, the smartest or the most intelligent or those who would do the best on this test. And so maybe I I probably just assumed that, you know, they probably just couldn't even continue on. And so the rest of us in the entire class were working and working and working. And we hadn't even got through uh, maybe a little more than half. And the teacher said five minutes. And so now you're just scrambling for answers and just trying to uh, put in answers. And then when the test was over, she stopped everyone. She, She handed back the test. And she said, now read the entire test. And as we read through again, now not answering, and we got to the very final question, which was actually an instruction. It said, now ignore every other question on this test and sign your name and you will get a hundred. The fact of the matter is that the the way to, to actually get the best grade was just to read as she had instructed and then to sign your name and trust that the professor having promised that would make that promise True. And it was. Those two got hundreds and the rest of us suffered because we were going to make it happen. We were going to earn. And in the end, the best way was through trust. You know, in that same way, that's what God says. He says, stop striving to have all the right answers and instead trust me and what I tell you is true. I pray today that you will trust him, that you, that what Christ did was not just enough to save you a one-time salvation, but is enough to save you as you continue on, to continue to grow you and allow you to experience that fruit of peace and joy and contentment in him because of the ways he's promised. That if we live as, yes, it sounds strange, as servants and we put ourselves a holy as, as, a, as a living sacrifice and give ourselves totally to him and make him our complete joy and satisfaction in what he says, that in that is when we truly experience it. May you be blessed today, and I hope you have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week. Bye.